Good afternoon, and welcome to How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the National Day. My name is Raul Gabriel, and I'm a 2L here at the law school and a co-organizer for the Modern Money Network. In case this is your first event, the Modern Money Network is a multidisciplinary educational initiative that asks tough questions about economics, monetary and fiscal policy, and the financial system. Most often, we do this by asking two critical questions, the first being, what is money? This is everywhere and always a question of legal design and interpretation. Second, we ask, how does money work? In the sense of how does it pool, ebb, and flow between and through institutions from an operational perspective? At the law school specifically, the MMN encourages law students to think about macroeconomic questions, an aspect of the typical legal curriculum that we think is unfortunately often absent. Today, in conjunction with the Columbia Law Review, we are discussing the national debt, which should be a subject of great interest if you've been following the news lately. Today's speaker, Frank Newman, is presently the Vice Chairman of Asia for Global Strategic Associates, and has published two books, free copies of which you can find in the back on your way out. Six Myths That Hold Back America and What America Can Learn from the Growth of China's Economy and Freedom from National Debt. He previously served as Undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance from 1993 to 1994 and as United States Deputy Secretary of the Treasury from 94 to 95. He has also served as a Vice President and CFO of Wells Fargo and of Bank of America. He was President and CEO of Bankers Trust from 1996 to 1999, and in 2005 he gained CEO of Shenzhen Development Bank and was the first non-Chinese executive in modern times to run a Chinese bank. So he's quite well versed in the subject matter. Mr. Newman will zoom out and address the framework of how we think about the national debt and government budgets more generally. Some of these arguments you might find familiar, but Mr. Newman will also zoom in and discuss institutional mechanics and, in his own words, the way the system actually works. I hope that you find this refreshing. Responding to Mr. Newman will be our very own Professor Michael Grates. Columbia alumni professor of tax law. Professor Grades previously served as assistant to the secretary, special counsel, and deputy assistant secretary for tax policy at the U.S. Treasury, as well as on the commissioner's advisory group of the IRS. So without further ado, Mr. Frank Newman. Thanks, Raul. Um, Thanks to Professor Greats for, for joining us today. Thanks to Rohan Gray, who couldn't make it today, who helped organize a, a lot of this. And I hope you all find it interesting. This is a, a fascinating topic because we're talking here about issues that are extremely important to the nation, actually to lots of different nations, but looking at them in a brand new way, in a way that's very different and challenges a lot of the normal assumptions. And that's always a, a fun thing to do. So here's the, the book. This is just a little bit of my background, just so you'll see where I'm coming from. Uh, uh, and, and Raul just went through most of this. But it affected the way I approached these issues. You, some of you may have been to some of the modern money theory uh, discussions that, that Raul and Rohan have, have organized. They take a somewhat different approach and come out with a lot of similar conclusions. I just took a different road uh, there based on, on my particular experience. This is the first book. This is it in Chinese, if anyone's interested. It was uh, published in China also. And uh, I'll just take a moment on the first book because it leads into the main topic of the, of the second book. And basically, they, the concept is that people have accepted a lot of things you hear in the newspaper and you hear our learned congressmen talking about as if they were true, without stopping to think, well, wait a minute, is this really right? And, and uh, if it's not right, it makes a huge difference. America has, in fact, talked itself into believing that we can't afford to do anything. I happen to be particularly big on infrastructure. I'm really disappointed when I see how much infrastructure is building in China and how our highways and electrical system and airports and shipping ports are all deteriorating and our dams um, it, I think it's a, it's a major issue. Chinese economy has done extraordinarily well during this period of time. The, the numbers you see here, difference between 4% cumulative over this five-year period and 55% is just 
striking. We all know that a developing economy will grow more rapidly than a, than a mature economy, but these numbers are, are indicating something else. I was just at a conference, an economic development conference in Beijing, where I was the only uh, American uh, in the agenda. But what I told them is I thought the biggest risk for them was if they listened too much to us, because we have clearly got it wrong, and they have had, uh, had much better results. So here's the, the main book, the topic for today. As Raul mentioned, it's in the news constantly. A lot of the legal issues are in the, in the news, as well as the economic uh, and financial issues. Uh, one of the key things uh, in, in terms of this month's activities is that the debt ceiling really potentially could cause huge problems in the financial system, much more, I think, than has typically been mentioned. People talk about, well, bond rates could go up, but it's much more devastating than that. In my view, far, far more risky than uh, the failure of Lehman Brothers if, in fact, the uh, interest on, on treasuries is not paid. Uh, the Law Review has published a very interesting article about the, the trilemma that the president would face in trying to, to meet his constitutional responsibility. There was, some, there was an article in the New York Times today that addressed uh, some of these things. There are lots of different theories. We'll come back to that later, I'm sure, during the Q&A. My perspective is from an economic and financial system perspective, not a legal one. Um, you know, This is a room full of people who are trained in the law. But uh, obviously the two intersect, and I think I can maybe add a little bit of some of the practical issues that uh, affect the, the legal issues as we're going on. So there are two separate issues to talk about. One is why we should feel free of national debt. The, the, the title of the book, Freedom, really means you don't have to do anything except understand the issue better. Once you understand it, the issue better, you, you can stop worrying about it. Once you reach that point, then there are a whole separate set of issues of what do you do. And people can legitimately debate, and, and sometimes not so legitimately, uh, debate about what, uh, what we ought to do. But that's sort of a, a separate topic. I'll give you some of my views, which again emphasize infrastructure. But uh, the first and the main point is just intellectually, what is the basis for this great fear about national debt? It really is important. Uh, I, I think a lot of you believe that ideas influence policy and even politics, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But the underlying intellectual basis for the fear of national debt and how that fear then translates into a huge number of policy uh, decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. and in capitals all around the world uh, are just extraordinarily important. And I, they, the point, the main point of this book, the reason I wrote it, is because I think the intellectual underpinnings of the way that people traditionally look at what's called national debt are flawed, uh, seriously flawed. And uh, understanding is, is the key. So what's been the practical effect of these fears? Well, it's kept us from doing a lot of things. It's made our economic growth needlessly slow in comparison to places like China who didn't worry about it. It's harmed uh, education, environment, uh, you know, defense, whatever it is that you think is good that the government might be doing, even lowering taxes. Um, the fear of the national debt has interfered uh, with that, and it's just needless. So the way the book approaches things, and the way I've been thinking about them, is to say, well, why is it that people have this great fear about national debt? Um, and to look at the main reasons, the things that are typically said, and say, well, do they hold water or not? And obviously my conclusion is they don't hold water. If this stuff is really contrary. It, I, and I have to tell you that, because you hear it so often, all these uh, almost sometimes moralistic statements about how we have to contain the national debt, and it's a, we have to get our fiscal house in order, whatever that means. Sounds like a good thing, but a little, little loosey-goosey to me. Um, Mark Twain had this great quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Uh, and that, that's a fun way to, to think about these issues. Um, I did want to mention thanks to Bob Solo, who's, uh, it, even though the vast majority 
of the academic economists around the world are still on this national debt concern. There are a few people who broke it free of it. Uh, some of them actually, uh, Rohl and, and Rohan and Brock here. But uh, Bob Solo has been my advisor. He's a very highly respected uh, sort of elder statement, statesman of academic uh, economics. And he, uh, he really thinks this makes sense. I, I asked him jokingly, I said, Bob, is it okay with you if I tell people that you think this makes sense because it's so contrary to what your, a lot of your uh, colleagues are saying all over the place? And he said, I'm not running for office, he said, uh, and I think you got it right, so fine. Tell them, tell them that I think you got it right. So thanks uh, to Bob. So what does national debt mean in the United States? It means U.S. Treasury securities. If you say it that way, it doesn't sound so evil. But national debt has, has just a funny term. It has implications that people think of in terms of their personal debt that just don't apply. And that's one of the things that the, the book tries to bring out. Actually, there are 50 million Americans who have money invested in, uh, in U.S. treasuries. So I, I jokingly here suggest that why don't we just change the term, call it national capital, like the capital of a corporation instead of calling it debt. Okay, just a few things because then we're going to move on the main, the main time today. I hope we'll do a discussion and Q&A. First thing is, the government is different. You hear these, these uh, comments about people say, well, you and I and our family has to make sure that our, our income and our revenue are balanced. And if you're running a small business or a farm, you have to make sure that you have enough income to cover your expenses. And therefore, the federal government needs to do the same thing. Well, that's a a cute, kind of quaint way of looking at things. It just isn't true. And it's a huge leap to jump from a family to the entire United States government. Uh, and there are lots of things in the world where there are components of a larger entity that are subject to certain constraints, but the larger entity itself is not. And it's, uh, you know, it's a concept, I'm sure, that as you study the law, that, that you run into frequently. But this is something that sounds great but, uh, in fact, is not true. And, in fact, it, it, it's almost, it almost never occurs. So the people who say, well, we have to do this, have lost sight of the fact that it almost never happens. Okay? The government, and the government here and governments around the world very, very rarely take in as much revenue as they, they, uh, they, they have to spend. So there's got to be something else going on here that, that needs to be understood doesn't mean deficits don't matter. It means you have to say, well, why do they matter? What's going on? Deficits are important to help support the economy when unemployment is high. And if you've got a really hot economy, which we hope we'll have sometime in the future, when, when uh, medical expense, uh, medical, Medicare, for example, may be higher, then you have to worry that too much of a deficit could cause inflation. So there are things to worry about, but they need to be put in perspective. Another thing you hear is, well, we've got this great burden we're, we're laying on our, our children and our grandchildren. They're going to have to pay huge taxes in order to repay the debt. Well, again, it's just not true. And it has never been true. The United States has had uh, debt outstanding for, ever since Alexander Hamilton for 220 years and never fully paid it off. You pay off an individual instrument, but never pay it off in aggregate. And the amount of taxes that we're paying this year to pay down the national debt in aggregate is zero. Zero last year, zero next year. Two of my children are here today. Don't worry, you won't have to pay for it, okay? And, and, and our grandchildren won't. It's just not going to happen. It's just the, the wrong concept. And it, it's funny, people keep talking about it, again, without saying, wait a minute, this doesn't happen. Why do we think it's going to happen in the future? What's going to be different? It, it's just a long, uh, strange concept. In fact, the people who put together the budgets in Washington never even plan on it, including the most conservative budgets, the budgets that come out of the most conservative uh, bodies in Washington, have a budget that reduces the deficit over time. But if you look over a 30-year period, they do not plan to repay the $12 trillion worth of, of Treasury securities outstanding. They don't plan to repay any of it. So even though 
one side of their mouth, they say, oh, this is a great burden because we have to pay it back. On the other side, when they actually present a budget, they present a budget that pays down zero. And that's just the, the way it is. Another interesting way to think about it, we could maybe come back to this in the Q&A, is government issues other kinds of paper. They issue $20 bills, okay? That never has to be paid back. Okay, um, another big thing is people say, well, the United States is going to head to Greece. We're, we're going to have the same problems the Eurozone countries had because we, we issued too many treasuries. Um, but it's very different. And again, the book tries to explain this. Euros can move from one country to another. U.S. dollars live in the United States, in the U.S. financial system. It's the only place they can live. And they get recycled around in, in, a, in a country that has its own monetary system, its own currency, its own central bank, the U.S., the U.K., China, Japan. Uh, these, you see often people say, well, the ratio of debt to GDP is getting too high. And a couple of, the, a couple of Harvard professors published a, a book on it, and there was some controversy about their Excel sheets. But the, the main problem is that the concept is wrong. There's just no rationale for it. There's no logical reason for being concerned about that particular ratio for a country that has its own currency and can print money and can, can create money. So I, I think it's more important to step back and look at the total set of financial assets in the, in the country, uh, which is like $180 trillion. And there are lots of different financial assets. Some of them are money, some of them are treasuries, some of them are, are, are bonds, uh, stocks, all kinds of different things. Okay. Then there's the myth of the, this is the last one I'll cover today, the myth of the bond vigilantes. This is the people who every year for many years have said, aha, we're issuing so many treasuries that the markets are going to rebel, they're not going to be willing to buy them, the interest rates are going to be driven way up, the, the, the bond uh, investors just won't sell them. Well, it didn't happen. Then the next year, they say, well, it didn't happen last year, but this year it's going to happen. It didn't happen. Next year it's going to happen. It never happens. And, and I keep thinking if, if we had a weatherman on TV who constantly was predicting a giant storm and the giant storm never came, we might say, you know, maybe his meteorological model has a flaw in it. Maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with the way he's thinking about the issues and we need to step back and rethink it. But people don't give up. They keep saying, well, yeah, it didn't happen last year, but it'll happen next year. And in fact, the logic is flawed. It, will never happen, it can never happen, and it's just fundamentally wrong. Another thing, uh, Raul referred to this earlier, you have to step back and think, of what does money mean? Money is it's hard to define, it can be defined in lots of different ways. The way it's typically defined for reporting purposes when people talk about the money supply is basically money in banks. But bank money is a liability of commercial banks. They're at risk. This is just another form of financial asset. It's not as if money, in that sense, is some God-given thing of, of, of absolute certainty. It's just a liability of a commercial bank, which may or may not be good. And in fact, in 2008, there was a lot of worry that they would not be good. People were starting to, to uh, panic and have runs on some banks. Uh, and the U.S. government came to the rescue. How did the U.S. government come to the rescue? With U.S. Treasuries financing. Money, the government put money into banks to, to shore them up. Where did the U.S. government get the money? From U.S. Treasuries. U.S. Treasuries are far, far the safest, most liquid thing that, that you can invest in U.S. dollars in, and will continue to be that, despite all the, the shenanigans going around in, in uh, Congress right now. People have the wrong concept of Treasury options. They say, well, why should we take our good money and give it to the U.S. government when we're not sure what, how solid that's going to be. It's exactly the opposite. What's happening is people have money in banks, especially big players. If you look at where the big money is, if you've got $100 million or $100 billion, okay, you don't want to keep it in a bank. It's just too risky. So people have to go look and say, well, I will buy all the treasuries that, that exist. The, the big players do that. And if there aren't enough treasuries to go around, I'll have to leave some money in the bank, but I really don't want to do that. So it's a different way of thinking. This, I'm almost done here. These are just some other points that um, 
that are pointed out in the back. The, the, one of the key things is that, that this is really odd, that in Washington there's this great focus on the cumulative deficit over 10 years when people talk about things, because they're afraid of building up the, the national debt. And they say, well, you know, we've got this program, and how much is it going to cost over, over 10 years? And they're missing the point. Uh, they're trying to get prepared for the future when, when Medicare, for example, is going to be a much higher expense. But that's a little bit like saying, well, we expect it's going to be cold in January. And in order to be prepared for that, we will start wearing our sweaters now. Okay? Or wearing them in August. It doesn't make any sense. It's because it's not your average body warmth that matters. It, it matter, what matters is your body warmth at the time when things go on. So to plan ahead for 10 years to use the cumulative amount of money over that period of time is simply the wrong measure. People are, are just focused on the wrong thing. Then the last thing is, what do you do once you think you're free? I, I, I try to emphasize for people, I'm a private sector guy. I'm not trying to, to push the government uh, into taking a, a bigger role unless it absolutely has to. And I think the private sector is a wonderful thing for America and will continue to be. But there is a positive role for government. Uh, I particularly, as I mentioned, like infrastructure, it can, it can keep the unemployment from getting too big and can provide um, extraordinarily important investment for the nation that can, can be uh, used in the future. Okay, thank you. We know Frank is a banker and not a lawyer because he started and finished on time, <laughs> um, for which I suppose we're all grateful. Yeah. So I just have one slide. Let me let me begin by saying that I uh, have, have read uh, Frank's books. I find them to be enormously interesting. I am uh, evidence that the Columbia Law School does not have any macroeconomics uh, on its faculty. I am not a macroeconomist. Ec and uh, when Frank mentions that Bob Solo is on his side, I know Bob Solo well. Um, and if it was intended to strike fear uh, in anybody who wants to criticize uh, what Frank has said, it certainly had that effect. Uh, um, if it's me against Bob Solo and we're doing macroeconomics, uh, I urge you all to put your money on Bob. Um, and I think, I, I want to begin by saying I think that, that Frank's analysis is an important antidote to what's going on now in the short uh, run and in the current discussions about debt and what we ought to be doing. Um, and I think there's a lot that we agree on. Uh, there is, um, uh, perhaps because he's fighting uh, extremes on one side, a sort of extreme what-me-worry uh, quality uh, to Frank's presentation and uh, books that I have to say leaves me a little uneasy. Um, that is to say, if the suggestion is we can spend as much as we want, uh, we don't have to tax anybody to pay for it, we can run deficits uh, till the end of time and sell our debt uh, uh, without any consequences, uh, that, I think, is, is, is as overstated as Frank thinks the debt clock uh, is overstated. That is to say, I think that I, I, I think it's an important point that we're not going to pay off this debt. Um, and there are people and forms of, of uh, analysis. Uh, I would uh, mention generation accounting, uh, which uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff and Alan Orbach, both very good economists, have promoted, in which they assume that future generations are going to have to pay taxes to buy down all of the outstanding debt. And I agree with Frank, that's uh, nonsense, and that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't think about it that way. Uh, and I think that, that one of the important insights uh, to me in his books uh, is the important uh, link between money and debt. And so for those of you who have followed uh, the current uh, debt uh, ceiling nonsense. Uh, one of the examples is the uh, print a trillion dollar coin. Um, that shows you that you can then have money 
sitting in the Federal Reserve and borrow against it. There is this close connection between dollars and treasuries that Frank emphasizes that I think is really worth thinking uh, very hard about. Um, there is, however, one big difference between money and treasuries, and that is that we pay interest on treasuries and we don't pay interest on money. Uh, and the chart that I've put up is one, the, the red line, if you can see it, that goes across is our historic level of revenues. This is a long-term budget projection from CBO. One need not take the numbers terribly seriously, but I think they're absolutely correct about the, the trends. And what it shows, largely because of the growth of Medicare and Medicaid and health costs, uh, is that at some point, uh, we're either going to have to start taxing ourselves more or spending less on health uh, than we do, uh, or we're going to have a problem. And I don't think Frank says anything that contradicts that. That's, that's the real economy, as I understand uh, your position. But the other uh, piece of this chart, which is the new piece, and this is new given the debt we've accumulated in, in, at the sovereign level, uh, that is, we've substituted sovereign debt for bank debt in, in some substantial ways. This has happened around the world. And what's happened is that in terms of federal budgetary terms, there is this now top uh, chart of interest expenditure uh, that continues to grow over time. Uh, if you put the interest on the bottom and the rest of the stuff on top, you'd see that the current uh, level, the historic level of revenue is not enough to pay the interest on, on the federal debt. Uh, to put it in some context, if in 2020 we have $20 trillion of debt, which is pretty close to what people are estimating, if we had an interest rate of 5%, we would be, somebody would be paying uh, a, a trillion dollars a year of interest on that debt. Now that's a trillion dollars that we wouldn't pay on money, and there I think the analogy um, is a problem. Um, uh, let me say something else that I, that I agree with uh, before, before going on to raising some questions, and that is the, uh, I don't know which is worse, uh, and Frank doesn't say which is worse, but they're both bad. One is the debt clock, which Frank hates, uh, and the other is uh, the nonsense about us becoming Greece. Uh, which, uh, which, you know, certainly is the one I probably hated before reading Frank's work more, uh, because of the fact that you know the answer would be if there were a drachma and Greek, Greek, Greece still had its own currency, uh, the drachma would be very, very cheap right now. The currency would have devalued. They can't devalue because they're in the eurozone, uh, and therefore uh, Germany's sound economy is keeping just to mention one, is in other northern European countries, are keeping the euro um, at a much higher value than, than, than the southern uh, states of Europe would be. And the U.S. is in, simply in a very different position by having its own currency, which can then uh, fluctuate based on uh, responses to uh, the American economy. Uh, the two points that I really want to press uh, Frank on and, and, and have him uh, discuss with us uh, are uh, the point about interest, uh, that is, whether this accumulation of interest, we know we're not going to pay off the debt, but we also do know that we are going to pay interest. And then the question is, are we going to pay it with more treasuries or more taxes, because those are our choices. Um, and, and Frank seems to assume we're going to pay it with more treasuries and that we can continue to issue more treasuries, and that will pay the interest, and all we have to do, I guess, although it's not clear why, is raise enough taxes to pay for health insurance and Social Security and, and defense and, and the other uh, real parts of the budget. Um, as I say, I, I'm a little concerned about this interest expenditure growing over time. I think... At the heart of this is the notion, not that we should eliminate deficits, but that we should not have deficits constantly uh, that are greater than the growth in GDP. That is, that we should not have deficits uh, 
so that the increase in debt is constantly uh, happening uh, at a faster rate than the increase in our underlying economy. Um, there is uh, no number at which that becomes a, a problem uh, for uh, a country with its own currency, like the U.S. or Japan or or China, but at some point, I think it does become a problem. And and I and, and I read Frank, I think charitably, to say, well, it's just not a problem now, and it's not going to be a problem for the next uh, half a dozen years. And the economy would be much stronger if we went ahead and, and put our money in infrastructure, in particular, um, and other investments as opposed to consumption. Uh, made other investments with those um, uh, borrowed dollars, and then we would strengthen our economy and we'd be in much better shape. Uh, that I, I agree with entirely, and to the extent that that's the, the gravamen of, of Frank's message, I'm with him uh, 100%. I think that's right, but it doesn't mean that we don't have, we never will have a problem of, of paying interest or treasuries, and uh, at, least, at least for me, uh, it has something of the uh, of the view about climate change. Uh, that is to say, um, you know, maybe being a little more cautious about the greenhouse gases that we're pouring into the atmosphere uh, will save us from building up those gases at such a rate that if we need to do something, it, it will be much more expensive and much more costly to the U.S. economy uh, than we might otherwise suggest. Um, uh, the other uh, the other point um, that I want to just emphasize uh, is that Frank seems to care nothing that the debt is held by foreigners instead of U.S. people. Um, so we're at debt levels uh, that we have not approached as a share of the economy uh, since the end of the Second World War. Um, but the difference is that at the end of the Second World War, 95% of, of the debt was held by Americans. If we paid the interest on the debt or paid off any of the debt, it would go to Americans. Uh, when we pay the interest on the debt now, it does not go to Americans. Uh, Frank points out, and I think this is correct, that they have to use these dollars, and they will either use these dollars, uh, he's got a, a, several steps in this process, but I will shorten it, they either have to use these dollars to buy U.S. goods and services, or they have to invest in, in dollar-denominated assets. Um, those are two very different things, I think. That is to say, um, if... Uh, and, and the underlying problem... So there's an underlying problem is that we're not preparing for our spending in any way. Our tax system... Don't get me started on this. I do know a lot about this. Our tax system is completely archaic, and incapable, in my view, of supplying enough revenue to solve the problems, even on, on, on Frank's uh, view, that we only have to worry about uh, real expenditures and ignore interest on this chart, uh, which I don't fully accept. Uh, but I also think that um, uh, the, the reason that we have all of this uh, money being bought by foreigners is because we have a huge trade deficit with... Uh, uh, countries like uh, China, um, so uh, uh, they're selling us goods and services. They have all these dollars. They can either, I think as Frank would say, put them in a bank or, or buy treasuries, and treasuries are safer. That, I think, is right, but they don't put them all in treasuries. They're also buying up other uh, dollar-denominated assets, of which Smithfield Ham, I think, is one uh, prominent uh, Southern example. Uh, I should say, by, by way of, of, of confessing to a Southern uh, bias, that I'm going to have to leave at about 1.15 because I'm going to see the Atlanta Braves hopefully beat the L.A. Dodgers tonight in Atlanta. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but I think owning Smithfield Ham and other uh, companies, and, you know, at some point they'll run out of Smithfield Hams and they might have to buy Google. Or, or Apple, or, or somebody else, I, I think that the, that the buying of assets with all of these dollars uh, is an important risk to the, to the future of the U.S., not one that we need to worry about right now, and probably not one that we need to worry about in any uh, foreseeable, um, short, you know, relatively short-run period, a 10-year period, for example. But if we keep doing this over time, 
uh, endlessly. They've got to do something with those dollars. And when they uh, find that American goods and services are not what they want, they're going to continue to buy U.S. assets. And I think that's a problem. So, so I think there is a problem. And I guess I would just say, I think that it is overstated to say that it is not a, that interest on the federal debt is not a problem, and that the ownership by foreigners is not a problem. Uh, on the other hand, um, given the forces that Frank is pushing against, and the uh, lack of clarity about the relationship between treasuries and printing money, um, which I think he does uh, make clear, I can see why he's decided, at least in my view, to overstate things uh, on the other side. Um, I, I will tell you that, uh, uh, that one of my difficulties uh, throughout my professional life has always been uh, that I tend to find myself in the middle of the road and people tell me there's nothing but uh, road meat uh, there. So, uh, so uh, with the risk of becoming uh, road meat, I'll, uh, I'll give uh, Frank a chance to respond. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, and there, those, the questions you raise are really interesting. And as I was writing this book, I went through a number of issues where I was working in my own mind saying, is this really right? <laughs> it seems like it's so far from, from what we've heard a million times. Uh, I just have to go through this carefully. And, and you just touched on uh, a couple of the issues. But before I address the, the two main issues you, you raised, I want to come back to another thing you mentioned about the, the money that, and the treasuries, which I think is very important. And it is very current right now in this big all this consideration about the debt limit, and maybe something that some of you students may want to look into. And that is that uh, there are lots of theories about what might be done in order to deal with a potential uh, catastrophic circumstance if the debt limit is not increased. The most catastrophic circumstance, I believe, is if some treasury securities were not fully serviced, if the interest were not paid. And as I mentioned before, they, there are a huge number of transactions in the financial system that involve treasury securities, and I think the, the congressmen do not understand this. There's no reason why they should. They haven't been in, in finance. They haven't been in banking. But the, the implications of the interconnected system is you put treasuries in a, in a position where they could be legally at, in default are beyond comprehension. They could be just absolutely devastating the financial system. Is it possible that some way it could be worked out, the Fed could provide some liquidity to get us through this? Maybe. But the risk is clearly not worth taking. And so that puts the President in a position of saying, what could he do? Uh, the the Law Review article talked about, well, he should issue bonds anyway. Uh, he's got this dilemma. He's got, he can't meet his spending obligations and he can't uh, raise taxes unilaterally. The, the trillion dollar coin that Michael uh, referred to is another uh, possibility that's, that's talked about. Um, in my book, I talk about prioritization, of saying, okay, if you have a limited amount of funds, you can take the money that you do have and prioritize it to, to servicing treasuries in order to avoid a catastrophic circumstance. The Law Review article raises some questions about the legality of that, but the Law Review article also talks about you have to make the best choices you can under the circumstances, and sometimes in order to avoid catastrophe, you have to do what you have to do, and it should survive legal challenge. All these are, are fascinating questions. Uh, the mechanics of whether the, uh, the prioritization can be done is, is an interesting question. The, the question of... Uh, Professor Greats and I have both been in the Treasury Department. There's an interesting question about the career employees there and their participation in, a, in an act which they are not sure is in compliance with law. Because they're, they're there, they'll be there for the next president and the next president, and they're, they're very cautious about that. Well, I have another potential solution which would require some legal research in order to figure it out. And that is that the Fed... That just triggered in my mind when, when 
Professor Grace was talking, um, the Fed owns two trillion dollars of treasuries at the moment. Okay. Traditionally, the way the debt limit is computed is to take all the treasuries that have been issued by the Treasury Department, plus some internal accounts for Social Security, and add them up, and that's, that's the number that's used. But I think a case can be made that the $2 trillion held by, held by the Fed are no longer a liability of the United States government, and that the intent of the law was to get at how much liability, if you want to think of it in those terms, I don't even think it's the right way to think of it, but if you want to think of it in those terms, what kind of liability does the United States government as a whole have? Not just one department of the government, not just the Treasury, because the Federal Reserve is, in fact, a part of the United States government. So, in fact, the total amount of Treasuries on the, if the, on the U.S. government's balance sheet, if you did it by modern accounting, would be net of that $2 trillion. And we have $2 trillion worth of room right now, and the President could just go ahead and say, you know, we're $2 trillion shy of the, of the limit. There's no problem. This is something, if any of you have any interest in, uh, Rohan and Raul have talked, to, and I have talked about this a little bit, if anyone wants to research, the, you have to go into the wording of the law, and maybe even the legislative history, to, in order to determine that. But if a corporation had issued bonds, and a subsidy or any unit of that corporation had bought some of those bonds back and was holding them, then under modern accounting standards, on the balance sheet of that corporation, they would report the net amount of the bonds, net of what had been repurchased, not the gross amount. So I, I think there are precedents where where the, the president could follow that. And it's just an interesting possibility to solve the whole problem. I haven't seen it discussed anywhere else, so here's, here's an opportunity for, for any of you who are interested. Okay, come back to Professor Gray's two, two key questions. Um, I'll take them so, so, Frank, maybe it's a, maybe I can just say something yeah, about yeah. what you just said. Um, I do not think the computers can prioritize. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about the, the, the people. Yeah. I don't think you can rejigger the computers enough to, to prioritize spending in a way that will that will solve the debt problem. I think it's 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 they're going to send out social security checks. Yeah. And you can stop some of it, but but I don't think you can stop enough. Uh, so I think it's it's more than the personnel. So I think prior, prioritization is not a solution. Um, I, I have the same view that you do about the Fed of the intergovernmental debt. That is the money that's sitting in, mm -hmm. in Social Security and mm -hmm. other trust funds. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why do we count that? It's an asset of yeah. the government in the same way that the uh, Federal Reserve money is an asset. So... Um, you know, the, the, the trilemma uh, exists, and if you can come up with an accounting, a clever accounting solution, uh, that would be better and more consistent with practice in the private sector uh, than uh, uh, doing something uh, that really that really has a uh, has major effect. So accounting gimmicks, uh, if they solve this problem, are something we should all, all be for. Uh, if Congress uh, doesn't come to its senses and raise the debt uh, ceiling. Okay, um, I, I agree with that. These, the, the practical issues are extraordinary, and I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, since I've been there, uh, it's 15 years now, but I don't know how much the Treasury has done to try to prepare for this kind of thing, because uh, as you just said, the prioritization is extraordinarily difficult. All the systems are set up to pay everything, not to pay some things. It's, it's really tricky stuff. But similarly, I, I've talked with bankers who's, where I've said, you know, if, if the uh, if treasuries are not serviced, you're going to have all these major problems. You've got thousands and thousands of transactions with treasuries as collateral. What are you going to do? What's going to happen? And they said, oh, yeah, it's going to be a nightmare. So I said, well, what are you doing to get prepared? And they said, just hoping that Congress will come to its senses at the 11th hour because this is just too hard. Okay, that's not very encouraging. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, let me talk about the foreign uh, stuff first. And basically, I think uh, we're in agreement. Uh, the, the heart of the issue, Professor Gretz got at, is the trade deficit. The trade deficit causes the situation where foreigners hold U.S. dollars, to, U.S. dollar assets of one sort or another. Um, the, the latest figures I've seen that are that in total U.S. 
citizens, companies, entities, hold about $20 trillion worth of foreign assets, and foreigners hold about $23 trillion worth of dollar assets, so they hold $3 trillion net. But that's out of a total of 180 trillion of financial assets in the United States. It's three out of 180. It's not huge at the moment, but it's still an issue. And, and as Professor Great said, if it grows and grows and grows, it could be a real problem because that represents real claims by foreigners on U.S. production in the future. The distinction uh, I try to, to make is that fine. Uh, not fun. They, they own the three trillion dollars, but whether they put it into buildings or a stock market or corporate bonds or, or mortgage securities or, or the bank or treasuries doesn't really change things. So the fact that they happen to have chosen to put a lot of their money into treasuries doesn't make treasuries bad in some fashion. It's just they made a rational decision. They took uh, China has three trillion dollars uh, in, in total to. To, uh, to invest, they decided to put about two trillion into uh, private equity funds and stocks and buildings and all kinds of things like that. And a trillion, they decided they wanted to keep short term and liquid, and they put it into U.S. Treasury. It's a very rational thing to do. So I, I don't think it makes, as I said, it doesn't make Treasuries any more risky or our, our U.S. government position any more risky. There's really nothing else they can do with that money. Um, if it became a larger and larger percentage of our total financial assets, if it were 40 trillion out of the total 180 trillion that were owned by foreigners, then I think we'd have a really serious problem. Interest is a much more difficult issue, and I really labored over this myself because we know that the budgets, the, the federal budgets are put together including interest, although there has been a concept, which is noted in the book, of the primary deficit, which economists have used for a long time. So they, the, the theory gets back to, again, something Professor Gritz mentioned, which is, what are the demands on the real economy? Ten years from now, suppose Medicare is much bigger, and we have a full employment economy, and people are trying to spend more than they, the country can produce. Spend more on medical care, defense, TVs, Whatever it is, uh, uh, okay. Uh, if you, when, whenever you have a situation where people are trying to spend more than the economy can produce, it creates an inflationary environment. That is the worry. That's what would be the bad thing. It's not that there's something evil about it. It's not a, a moralistic thing. It's what are the economic consequences? The economic consequences would be inflation. But that will occur only in a full employment economy when there aren't spare resources available, because if you've got spare resources, you can fill the extra demand. And in fact, that's, uh, in my view, one of the obligations of government. You hope that the private sector will create full employment, and the government then can back off. But most of the time, that doesn't happen. Historically, it's happened very rarely in the United States, and very, very rarely in many other countries around the world. China faced up to that and, and said, you know, we've got our choice. We're going to have a small economy with everyone staying poor um, without the government spending more, or we can have a big economy and have people have more income if the government spends more. It was an easy decision. They just didn't worry about the, the national debt. Um, so you, you're still faced with this problem of what are the real resources. Interest does not consume real resources. That's the thing, I, after working through this a lot, this, this is the, the place where I came down. If, you, if the government spends money consuming doctor's time or consuming production of defense contractors or whatever it is that they might spend money on, um, even, even good things like building highways or more on education or whatever it might be, it actually consumes resources and it puts more demand on the economy. And if the economy is already strong, that can create an inflationary environment. Interest payments are just a transfer of, of accounts on, a, on computers. And they don't actually consume any resources. They don't compete for resources. So yes, the answer is I, I finally got to the point where I became convinced that the, it, it's perfectly fine to keep issuing treasuries to pay for interest. All they do in a, in a fundamental sense is keep the real value of the treasury roughly in line with economic growth and inflation. 
I've run some simulations. The, the numbers get big when you look at it in, in the way that's on this chart. But when you look at it as a percent of, of total financial assets in the United States, they never get big. Uh, you'd, you'd have to have an economy that was drastically un, uh, underemployed uh, in order to, to get the numbers to a big point. So this is a, a very tricky thing, and it's, a, it's an important question. So can I, can I ask, can I ask yeah. a, a question, one more question about this? So it's a transfer. Uh, Social Security is a transfer. And so all it does is take money and from one group of people and give it to another, especially under a pay-as-you-go system of Social Security. Um, with the amount of debt that is held by foreigners, the transfer of interest is a transfer from U.S. people to foreigners. And, and that, I think, is a distinction that's very important as compared to a transfer among U.S. holders of financial assets to other U.S. holders yeah. of financial assets. Yeah. And so it is the combination of interest and the amount of debt that's held by foreigners that gives me pause. Yeah, that's a that's a very fair point, and it gets back to the to the ori your original point, which is, it's the trade deficit that really, really is underlying the, the whole problem. Because right now, even if, if interest rates were five percent, which and they're, they're much below that right now, if we paid five percent on the three percent, uh, it's, it's less than three percent. It's it's, uh, it's three trillion out of one hundred and eighty. Uh, Trillion. That's a small percentage of a small percentage. It would, be, it would be a small thing, but it's still an issue. And it would be an issue even if people, the foreigners, had invested in corporate bonds and stocks instead of uh, treasuries. So it gets back to the to the trade deficit as being the, the focus. I, I also just want to make one other point. The, the distribution of that transfer could be very regressive depending on your tax system. Yes. And, yes. and, and so not only... Is it not a district, not a not a transfer between bondholders to other bondholders? It could well be a transfer from the middle class worker to to foreign bondholders, depending on how how you pay it off. And yeah. so I think saying it's a transfer, I mean at least to, to those of us who are used to the tax system, which is filled with transfers, uh, saying it's a transfer is just the beginning of an inquiry, not the end. Okay, fair enough. It's it's a complicated issue for sure. Do we have time for any? Yeah, like yeah, we'll take student questions at this point. Yes. Um, one question with with this this question of, of interest coming up is there what is the reason to not use the trillion dollar coin or some similar monetary creation to pay down this debt and sort of wipe this whole question off the table, or why continue issuing bonds when the government has this power of creation, why not just create the money directly rather than through this this whole dance of, of uh, bond creation? Yeah, so it's... Yeah, go on. Sorry, yeah, Frank, could you, uh, yeah. please repeat the question in your response? Oh, if sorry. you could turn on your mics, um, which are directly in front of you, when you ask a question, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. So that's a a, um, a key question that, it, that people dealing with modern money theory are, have, have been trying to address with there are a couple of things. One is the, the trillion dollar coin, and the other is why even bother issuing debt? Why not just print the money and, and you, know, you know, literally print it, you can create it on a, on a computer to pay the, the uh, country's bills? And the, the trillion dollar coin has some legal issues um, which have been researched and are continuing to be researched and have advocates on both sides. Um, it also has some practical issues because in order to do that, you need the cooperation of the Federal Reserve. And I, you know, here's where I think some of my experience in Washington uh, can be of some help. Um, because the Fed is very reluctant to get into the middle of a, of a dispute with Congress. They are, and it's not a department of the, of the president's uh, control. Uh, they're, they're already under pressure from Congress and under attack for problem, from Congress. For the, for the Fed to cooperate in something that Congress might think is just bypassing the will of Congress 
could create huge problems for them. And my expectation is that the Fed would find every excuse they possibly could to not cooperate on the trillion dollar coin. They would raise the legal issues, they would say they wanted to have a, a court interpreted, you know, whatever they could come up with to try to avoid that. So economically, I don't think it matters. You know, it, it's fine. It doesn't make any difference. It's exactly what you said in, in your second point. It doesn't matter. Um, but as a practical matter within the political structure, I think it's it would be very, very difficult to pull off. The, the, the question you asked about why not just print the money, that would be fine. It would take away one of the key tools that the Fed has used to control the growth of lending in the past, which is to extract reserves from the banking system by buying bonds. If you already have a huge amount of excess reserves in the, in the banking system and you keep adding to them, it takes away that tool. But Fed could do something else. They could raise required reserves. They could do, do other things. Um, but So it's a very good question. They, they, the concept doesn't fit that. The traditional concept of the money has to come from someplace and the government can't shouldn't create it doesn't allow for that. But in fact, it wouldn't be a problem at all. Professor Briggs, I know you need to go to an important uh, <laughs> uh, event. Something has to so, take priority thank over, you. over money. Thank you. For, <laughs> yes. Well, it's it's the reason we have a, a system in which people can earn money and, and spend it on things that give them pleasure, like uh, important baseball games. Sorry, everyone. Uh, even though Professor Gretz has had to leave, uh, we'll stick around at uh, Mr. Newman's discretion for further questions. Okay. Next question. Yes. In the back. Well, we do catch that. I couldn't quite hear the double. So the speaker asked um, why employment or unemployment is the crux of which we start worrying about the deficit generally. Okay. The reason is that um, when the economy has spare capacity, as people unemployed and maybe equipment unemployed, then if the and and what you hope is that the private sector will will spend more money. Businesses and consumers will spend more money and put everyone to work. But often that does not happen. It has not happened in the past five years, and over history it rarely happens. So the government can then step in and say, okay, we will provide extra uh, demand on the economy. We will build highways or, or repair them or build new dams or whatever. Um, and that works fine when there is unemployment and then people who are unemployed can go to work for the construction companies and they now have jobs and, and that will lead to more spending which will be uh, great for the economy. But if you have a situation where everybody already has a job and the government says, well, I want to build a new highway, where are they going to get the, the employees? Everybody's already fully employed. There's nobody to do the work. The only way you can get it is by competing with the people who are already employed, raising wages, raising prices, and that's where the inflation comes from. So the, the, the issue is to be aware in, in government policy of what are the circumstances in the economy at the moment. I, basically, I use the analogy in the book to say, when it's hot in the summer, you need air conditioning. So if you've got a really hot economy, you need to cool it off. That's one of government's responsibilities. Cool it off by spending less. But when the economy is cold, they need heat. And so that's the time that the, that the government ought to come in and, and add heat by, by spending money, hopefully spending it wisely on something that will be useful over time. Right now, they, when I, one of the things I like to mention where people say, well, we're leaving this great burden for our children and grandchildren to, to pay off the national debt, which I don't think is true. What we are leaving to our children and grandchildren is a crumbling highway system, a risky uh, electrical uh, grid, dams that are in danger of, of uh, collapsing and, and flooding. A whole bunch of poor infrastructure is an awfully bad gift to our children. 
further questions? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. I did have a question about how you sort of intellectually came to this understanding over time, because it is heterodox. And I'm just curious how you, how you, you know, your experiences uh, that drove you to, uh, to this kind of uh, discourse. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess as I've been exposed to a lot of these things, and I like to think about why. And I hear a lot of these statements, and I wonder. Yeah. Although I'm sorry. Yeah, the question was, how did I uh, come to uh, to think about these things and to decide to write the, the books? Okay. Um, and. It often seemed to me that people making public comments did not really understand how the financial system worked, and I happen to be in a position where I've been in banking, and I've been in the treasury, and I've seen some of these things. And so I just started to, to think through the issues and say, okay, this is what people say, but why? What's their reasoning? And it does the reasoning uh, hold water? And I just happen to like this stuff. So I went on with it. So, Mr. Newman, um, if you don't mind, we have a few questions from our online audience, um, just a couple briefly. The first one being about the existence or function of the U.S. Treasury market as a, as a financing vehicle for the government. It seems that you know there are other safe assets that the U.S. has, and you know the distinction being between uh, U.S. Treasury and those other assets seems to be the interest rate, as you both highlighted. So, in order to, you know, fund much of the government activity, why don't we just print money directly and save ourselves the interest welfare? Yeah, we we could do that. Um, it would take a change in concept and in the in the budgeting in the in the Congress, which is we know very difficult. But economically, it would be fine. It would leave the Fed with having to to deal with a different situation. Uh, in terms of how they manage the the banking system uh, over time, oddly enough, it would still cost some money uh, if if you kept the budget the way it's traditionally uh, figured, including interest, because all the money would go into the banking system as what's called excess reserves. Those reserves get paid interest by the Fed. So right now, the Fed is actually paying twenty five basis points, one quarter of one percent annually on all these reserves in the, in the banking system, which is actually more, a higher rate than short-term treasuries are, are costing. So it, it's an interesting trade-off. But if, if you really get through your, your head the things that I mentioned before, which is that the interest really doesn't matter, then none of this matters. And you can do it either way is fine. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Twitter, and this relates to not only the previous question, but also um, what, you discussed, what you were discussing a little bit in terms of accounting for the government. It seems that the Treasury owes the Fed some money. That's a little bit like the left hand owing the right. Could we consider the Fed's printing press assets to also be similarly something that belongs to the government's asset side of its balance sheet? Yes, we could. They, they, that's a good way to think about it. If you, if you think about... Uh, People compute liabilities to Social Security by taking discounting future outflows. You could say, well, the Fed, why don't we discount the, the, the future production of money? The Fed could do it. It would be a similar concept. Um, but the one of the many silly things about the debt limit law is that it focuses just on the liability side. It doesn't consider at all the assets. The United States government has enormous assets, and, and the country has enormous assets. Uh, it just picks this one particular thing, and the, the avenue that I suggested about the accounting is just one way of addressing the fact that the Fed is not another country. <laughs> the Fed is part of the United States government, and therefore, um, when it owns treasuries, it's, it's not a liability of the United States government. Um, great, another question. So. And this is related to the second to the last question, but is there any benefit at all to paying a positive rate of interest on any government issued instruments, including reserves, securities, etc.? Why not just issue a single government liability 
ash and call it a day. Yeah, again, <clears throat> you could do that. Um, and it would be basically fine. The Fed likes to have these tools available because this gets into a whole complicated thing, but they, they, there are all these theories that the money, the bigger money supply will cause inflation. I don't believe that. But what I do believe is that when banks lend more money into a hot economy, it creates more demand and that creates inflation. So it, and it creates more money at the same time. The way the Fed has traditionally controlled that is by keeping the what are called excess reserves that banks have um, at a very low level. And then if, they, if the Fed goes in and buys any treasuries, it can draw down those excess reserves and it shuts down the bank's ability to lend more at that point in time. It's an important control that the Fed has exerted. If, in fact, we essentially print a lot of money, then the excess reserves in the banking system will be huge. They're already they've become much, much bigger in the past five years than they ever were historically in the, in the first 95 years of the Fed. Um, but they would become even bigger, and that would give the Fed a challenge of how does it manage to, con to, to bring in banking system growth when it's an appropriate time to do that. They would have to be a part of saying, well, here's what we'll do. Maybe we need some new powers that we haven't had in the past. In China, the way they do it is just they call the chairman of the bank and say, no more lending. <laughs> okay, <laughs> works fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Can you use your mic? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, my question is um, related to tuna fish. Um, the fewer tuna, the more expensive the sushi. Um, if we continue to provide other countries with, with loans, um, you know, we've got over a thousand uh, military bases that we know of. Um, I mean, we're, we're essentially supporting the world. You know, we're supporting just about every other country, minus the, the 20 or so odd countries that, um, that do have a surplus. Um, and my question, I guess, is leading towards how can we fix this? I mean, do we, do we say, I'm sorry, but we can't help you, Israel? I'm sorry, but, you know, we can't provide you with any more weapons. You know, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna give you this month, this money, and expect nothing in return um, because your people are being slaughtered. I mean, you know, there's a, obviously a moral, moral and ethical dilemma between that, uh, saying no to a country that's in need. But we're in, you know, a perilous state right now here, um, and it seems like we're uh, paying more attention to other countries and issues outside of our own country and spending more there. Uh, what we kind of just it, you know, kept it all to ourselves and said, all right, let's, let's really, like you say, yeah. spend it on infrastructure. It's a very fair question, Tristan, and, and that's when I made the, the distinction earlier between trying to get rid of the fear of national debt and then the question of what do we do once we get rid of that fear, this fear that falls in the second category, the question of, okay, we're not prevented from spending the money, but where's the best place to spend it? And it's, the answers are not always clear, and you, you find people debating both sides of that. Um, some people would say, well, it does help our security, other people would say no, but that's a legitimate debate, that that's the kind of thing that Congress ought to be spending its time on, I think, rather than, than what it is spending its time on. Great. Um, another question from the internet, if you don't mind. So you spoke about turning on the air conditioning when the economy becomes hot. As an alternative to reducing government spending in order to do that, could the Fed regulate bank lending standards and tell them to you know, lend less? We know that lax lending was a huge problem prior to the financial yeah. crisis anyway. That's exactly right. And that's part of what I was alluding to before when I mentioned the Fed likes to have this mechanism to control the growth of lending during a period of time when the economy is hot. And they could do it using reserves, they could use, do it using open market operations, they could do it by putting more screws on credit quality. Uh, there are a number of ways they could approach it. It's tricky, and I, and I gave you the example uh, in China. Um, 
But it is an issue, one way or another. If any country has a, a really hot economy and they let the banking system continue to grow loans rapidly, it will cause a problem. It's just inevitable. Uh, in a way, it's a, it's a ni nice problem to have. Okay, It means your economy is doing well, and that's rarely the case. But it's nice to think ahead and, and hope that someday we will have a hot economy and we'll need to pull that uh, into, into play again. We certainly share that hope. <laughs> so you think that capital requirements can also be a useful tool in this air conditioning? Yeah, but it's harder to... Capital, it's harder to change capital requirements quickly. That's that's a longer term thing, and more most typically when you've got a, a period of time when the economy is very hot, it doesn't last very long, a, a year or something like that. And you need to put the brakes on hard and fast, and so you need tools that will shut things down uh, quickly. And capital requirements are are hard to implement, but they're a possibility. You could just say. You know, if you're a really strong regulator and you have the support of Congress, you could say, effective tomorrow morning, your capital standards are now doubled. If you can't lend anymore, too bad. Yeah, it's, uh, certainly there are political obstacles, but you, it would seem, based on what you're saying, that if the economy were to become really hot, um, you know, increases, for example, in the, the Basel regulatory standards could open up space even to, for the government to build infrastructure. You know, if, if we were faced with a choice of decreasing bank lending or continuing to spend uh, via the government, that there's almost a trade-off there. Yeah, there, that's, a, that's a real resource allocation problem, which is, a, as I just mentioned to Tristan, it's the kind of thing that I think the, the government policymakers ought to be focusing on rather than the silly stuff about worrying about the, the accounting for, for national debt. And, uh, you know, uh, Reasonable people, if we can find any in the Congress, reasonable people might have different views on whether it's more important to just let the private sector run or whether this is, it's more important to fix our highways. That's a perfectly legitimate debate, and people might come up with, with different conclusions, but that's why we elect them. Thank you very much. So um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Um, thank you all very much for coming, those of you who remain. Uh, this was the latest installment in the Modern Money Network series. We'll be having a panel next Tuesday led by Professor Jackson regarding law and economics education. If you're interested in the issues that Mr. Newman has discussed, first of all, please buy his books or pick up a copy on the way out. But second, you can check out our seminars from last year's series regarding uh, the analogy of government deficits to household deficits and another seminar titled Deficits, uh, Unemployment, and Debt, Identifying Real Threats to the Economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks.